And hello from the George Washington University. Welcome, I'm Frank Sesno, and you are an, in political theater, on center political theater on center stage. Out of time in American crisis, a Face the Facts USA special. Face the Facts USA.org is a project of the George Washington University where we put out facts each day because we feel that our discussion, our debate, our politics need to have facts put back into them. And our amazing panelists are going to help us do that here this evening. In the 90 minutes ahead, we will ask a very basic but important question. Can we Americans still do great things? I know you all want to nod your head yes. And I know you all agree. But it is a tougher question than it seems. We have the help of an amazing panel here from government, business, and media. We're asking them to play roles here tonight and to deal with a fictional scenario that may seem all too real to you and to them. It presents dilemmas and trade-offs. It requires decision and leadership. Our scenario has been meticulously researched, but the panelists don't know anything about it. This is all spontaneous and, uh, you ready for that, and unrehearsed. <laughs> like life. Like, uh, <laughs> we hope. Um, we are going to um, periodically refer to a fact. When you hear me say that, that's real. You in the audience here in the, in the hall, watching on C-SPAN, on Huffington Post, Fora TV, and elsewhere, you have a role as well, because you will be able to vote as we go and help shape the conversation that we'll have here on stage. So I'm gonna ask the first question right now. Let's just get right to it. So in the room, please pick up your handheld voting devices. Let me ask a very simple but seemingly relevant question. If, if a new national crisis arose, how confident are you that Congress and the President could agree on proactive, read that, effective plan of action? Now, is your confidence high, medium, low, or zero? If you're in the room and you're holding a handheld, go for the number. If you're at home and you have to text a keyword, trust me on this, H-con, high confidence, M-con, see, DEF-con, we wanted to stay away from that. But <laughs> you can put that in. We will get your answers uh, in just a moment. While you're voting, let me say once again for you and for our panelists here that what we're trying to do with this remarkable exercise this evening is make clear that the great challenges that this country confronts demand action. We actually have to talk to one another. I think I've heard you talk about that. We need to know what we're talking about. And we need to know how hard the business of governance really is. So how is the confidence level of the room and our voters? I wonder if we have that yet. Well, we'll get to it in a minute. Let me start by introducing our remarkable uh, panel. Let me start with Farai Chidea, author, blogger, Journalist, Carly Fiorino, CEO, business person, Senator Robert Bennett, former senator, businessman, Fred Thompson, I've refinanced my house because of you, <laughs> former senator, actor, and all around great American, Scott Rigel, member of Congress, James Fallows, renowned author and journalist, Mayor E. Pronounce it so I get it absolutely right. Iorio. Iorio. Pam yeah. Iorio, thank you very much. From Tampa. Near attendant from the Center for American Progress, President of the Center for American Progress, Bill Richardson, former governor, former Secretary of Energy, former everything, and master negotiator. And finally, Representative Donna Edwards. Thank you very much from Maryland, from not too far away. Right. Thank you all for joining us. Let's see how you are on the confidence index, folks. Let's put up the results. What have we got? Hmm, not so great. So 46% of you have low confidence that this government could operate uh, effectively confronted with a crisis. Let's get to it. It is sometime in the future, a hypothetical future, not very far away. I'm the president. <laughs> I've been wanting a promotion for a long time, Provost Herman. <laughs> I just gave myself one. Governor, you're my chief of staff. It's seven o'clock in the White House. We're early birds. Good morning, Governor. Good morning, Mr. President. <laughs> I love the sound of that. Hello, Representative. Good to see you this morning, Mr. President. Oh, it's just great. Okay, well, working at the White House is a terrific thing. It's a phenomenally interesting place. 
crisis a day. And we've got a crisis today. Europe has not been going well. They refer to it as austerity spring. And we've been watching the global news channel. Let's take a look at what we're seeing. In this hour's news, public opposition to European budget austerity has turned violent. There's growing opposition to last month's deal to preserve the euro currency. Spanish demonstrators are blockading harbors and airports, demanding that budget cuts and tax hikes be rescinded. More street protests in Athens and Lisbon, counter protests in Frankfurt and Berlin. Analysts warn the rising discord in Europe could signal a sustained period of market volatility. European stocks have tumbled on reports the rest of the austerity package, designed to stave off default, may be in jeopardy. All eyes are now on Wall Street, where trading begins in three hours. Where trading begins in three hours, and Governor, in three hours we have a meeting here at the White House. We're going to have a budget meeting, a bipartisan budget meeting, because we still don't have a budget. And they're gonna, those reporters are going to scream at me. They're going to want a soundbite. What do I say? I say, Mr. President, we've got to improve our ties with two sectors, Republicans and the business community. What we need to do, what I think you should do, which will send a very positive message, is say that we are going to move forward and follow the guidelines of the Simpson-Bowles Act. This doesn't sound like a soundbite to me. Well, I think those reporters, they're going to be. Farai Chadea is the leading progressive blogger in America. I mean, millions of people read you every day. And you're going to actually, you're covering the White House today. And you're going to come into that, to that photo op. What are you going to ask? What are you going to shout? Mr. President, are you willing to advocate for ending Euro dependency across the continent because some states are doing well, like Germany, but many others have been forced to cut social programs. So what's your response? Yeah. My response. <laughs> <laughs> what we need to do is, Mr. President, you need to address the nation tonight. And we need to send a clear message that we are going to get our fiscal house in order that we are going to find ways to balance the budget, that we're going to be inclusive, that we're going to find ways also this year to recognize that economic issues are not to be dealt with alone. We need a comprehensive energy policy. We need immigration reform. You have one year, talking about your legacy, you have one year where we're going to have enormous momentum to get things N done. Nira Tandon, you're my domestic policy mm -hmm. advisor. You're listening to him. Boy, that's a mouthful. That's more than a sound. Is that what I should say? Uh, you know, I'd say, look, the the thing that I would agree with, with the chief of staff, because I always think it makes some sense to well, agree with the chief tell, of staff. Tell, is, tell him. He's your boss. Um, uh, Bill, uh, I think, <laughs> I think, you know, I think we, what's important for us to argue is for stability. It's important for Europe to be stable. Global growth is a critical element to U.S. growth going forward. So I do think that we have to show strength and make a case for European stability. Europe breaking apart is a challenge. And that we have to make people in the United States recognize that these things are related. We need to have sensible budgets in the United States. We need to have responsible, uh, a responsible long-term deficit reduction, but we're having a bipartisan plan, and the important thing to argue in that bipartisan group is that we need everyone to come to the table, revenues and, uh, and savings. And we're all going to hold hands and sing Kumbaya. I can't wait. Senator Thompson, <laughs> you are the Senate Minority Leader, and you are passionate about the fact that this government is just spending too much. And you get on the phone with your colleague, because you're going to the White House, you're part of this mm -hmm. meeting today, and you say, you know that is gonna be there and she's mm -hmm. gonna ask those questions. And you call your friend there, ask him what he thinks you should say at this meeting. What do you think I should say? <laughs> <laughs> and make it short. America is not on the brink. The American economy remains stable. The American economy remains solid. What we're seeing in Europe is a forecast of what would happen if we don't get things in order, but it is not a basis to panic today 
and we, we shouldn't be selling short. So what are you going to say? I'm going to say that sounds mighty good to me. <laughs> and uh, I might add that uh, Europe's an important trading partner. Uh, it's probably going to have some effect on us and our economy. Uh, it's just another headwind that we face in dealing with our own problems, but just uh, another, uh, another indicator that we're going to have to clean up uh, our own act in terms of spending more money than we have uh, in order to avert the things you're seeing going on in the streets of Europe. Carly Fiorina, you're part of the <laughs> gathering, the brain trust. You're not sure you're going to get much of a word in edgewise here because you've got all these senators and other people in the room. But you represent business. One line to the president. What is it? We have to focus on growth and job creation. Simplify the tax code, which will create growth both for big business and small business. We have to be careful that we don't create the kind of structural rigidity that causes Europe to bleed jobs, which is part of their problem right now. But ultimately, it cannot be a future of austerity alone. It has to be a future focused on growth and creating more jobs. OK, we're going to leave this White House meeting now. I've had about enough of this. I'm not president anymore. And we're going to go to a place where they can't just have meetings and they can't just kick the can down the road. We're going to go to Striver City. Striver City is a great place. Hardworking Americans, been a bit under the gun in the last several years with this economy going down. And Representative Rigel, Representative Edwards, you are congressional members representing two sides, east and west, of Striver City. You are different parties, Republican, Democrat. You also rep represent the environs. Now, here's the problem going on in Striver City right now. The earthworm tractor factory employs 1,200 people. Earthworm's been kind of in trouble for a while now. And there's another plant you know, not too far away in Mountain Way. And Earthworm Mayor has been telling you for a while, we're going to have to close one of these plants. 1,200 jobs, if your plant closes, are going to go away. You convene a conference call, Mayor, because you're calling Washington now. Have this call with your representatives, what are you going to do, especially with this tumult in Europe? Because a third of Earthworm's stuff gets exported to Europe, and now Europe is in meltdown. Well, uh, we need to really have a, a focus on how we're going to make sure that cities, and our city in particular, doesn't suffer from continual job uh, depletion. We have had 10% unemployment uh, during the recession. We're just slowly getting out of it. And my main concern as mayor is that the budget cutting that you're talking about from Washington is going to have an adverse effect on our city and our attempts to recover from the recession. And on earthworm? On the tractor factory? Nothing's worse than earthworm. That is really a tough situation. And that employs a huge segment of people, as we all know. And I need help from Washington. You know, sometimes the local government can't do it all. So have the conversation with them specifically about what you want them to do to help you save earthworm. Well, what earthworm wants from us are really tax credits from Washington so that they can pay less in taxes. Uh, they want to have a training program because they don't feel that our city has uh, enough qualified workers. And so we need a job, tr job training program. And I think both of those requests are pretty reasonable, but I need help from Washington on both. Well, Mayor Iorio, I, I really appreciate you putting this call together. Uh, it's our friends and our neighbors who are hurting. Uh, both uh, Congresswoman Edwards and I, uh, I think, have been leading by example in what needs to be done in Washington, and that's uh, working together to advance sound policy, the common ground that we've been able to find uh, based on common facts, uh, the things that we know, both as Democrats and Republicans, that would lead to job creation, and specifically with respect to the factory. Uh, I'm working right now with a congresswoman to advance some legislation uh, that would give us the type of financing, the international financing, that we need as a nation to be competitive. Well, you know, Mayor, you reminded us, and I, want, I appreciate that, you reminded us that what happens in Europe has a direct impact on even our smaller communities. 
um, here in our, in, in our congressional district. And it's been great to work with uh, Congressman Riggle. But it seems to me that the kinds of things that Earthworm needs job training are things that are appropriate for the federal government to be able to provide resources for. Um, it also seems that we're getting a lot of pressure from our colleagues who are wondering why in the world do we have anything to do with Europe? They're going to hell in a handbasket. Um, and you've reminded us of the story that we have to tell our colleagues about how connected we are to what's happening in Europe, but we're not Europe. Um, and so we can do some things on job training. It does seem in the short term, too, we're going to have employees who are going to need unemployment compensation. I'm going to intrude on this conference call for just a minute because you're having a very nice conversation. But you know what's <laughs> happened over in Mountain Way at that plant? The mayor there is offering the plant straight tax breaks right out of the city budget. Will you do that? Well, Mountain Way is higher up, and they have a little bit more money. And we just don't have that kind of money in our budget. And so that's why I'm imploring our representatives to help us from the federal side. We can't always match city to city in terms of what we're able to offer. You're going to bail out well, Earthworm? No, look, the role of the federal government, I think, is to provide the right environment. Uh, but we're going to have to work through some difficult issues here with respect to the wage differential. And uh, as tough as it is, we're going to have to help the management and the wonderful uh, uh, staff there, the employment, the folks that are uh, building these quality products to make sure that they understand that they need to be competitive not only with Europe but also with other uh, cities and other states. I mean, this is a, an essential part of uh, a competitive environment and ultimately it's best for America, but it's tough. Well, Mayor, help as me out because I want to know what it is that you think you can do because then I think that helps us figure out what it is that we can do. Right. You know, and there's a lot that we've done to help this company over the years. But they have analyzed our workforce and really feel that we don't have the right labor market and that's where the job training needs to come in. And they feel that they're paying too much in taxes, which is a mixture of federal, state and local. And uh, so now we've reached this point. Now my concern is that from Washington, we hear a lot about budget cutting, and I don't want the monies for specifically for job training to go because that's been very helpful to our municipality over the years. We've used it for decades, and it's money that comes directly from the federal government that we don't. So you're have saying that the resource. city, you're saying the city can't help. You'll watch these 1,200 jobs oh, no. go away. No, we've you helped. You could cut. You could take. You could cut your police force a little bit. You could cut your teachers a little bit. You could cut the road. You know, the road repaving a little bit. Maybe you don't fix the sidewalk for a little bit. You've been a governor, well, right? I mean, she can do some. Mountain Way's going to. Well, I, I think I would, as governor, and this is a small state that we have, we can't afford to lose these 1,200 jobs. So as governor, what I will say to the mayor is I will suspend state taxes for a certain period of time. I will try to find capitalization in the state budget to, to help you keep these jobs because we can't afford to make that happen. I would say to our congressional delegation, very able bipartisan delegation, that you know if there's one message that you got to take to Washington is as a governor, I've got to balance the budget. Every state does or I go to jail. What would help we'll is visit if you, you guys. There, if it happens, we'll, we will visit you there. <laughs> right. But you, you, you've got to find a way to, to bring some fiscal discipline at the federal level. Uh, what I don't want is just the Department of Commerce coming in and bailing us out with, with job training funds and, and, and funds to tell us what to do when we lose our jobs for retraining. We want to keep these jobs. So as a president of Earthworm, um, ultimately You're actually the, you're president of the company that holds uh, Earthworm. Okay, president of the company that holds you're the Earthworm. Big, you're the big boss. Okay. Um, business decision making frequently happens on a different time scale than political decision making. And we're faced with a near and present need to make a decision. Demand has plummeted. We need to pick one of these sites, consolidate into a single site, and sadly, unfortunately, we are going to have to uh, lay off people. The reason I bring that up is because a job training program that might get into legislation, that might or might not get voted on at some point in the future doesn't fit my time frame. So in the end, what I'm going to do is go to 
first the mayors, then the governors, because they react a bit more quickly. I'm going to lay out where I'm getting the best deal, not just for the short and, and term, and if she doesn't do the but deal, over the medium to long If she can't term, give you the tax breaks that you need, what are you going to do? I will go to the other city, presuming that they give me both the right job training environment. The quality of the workforce is incredibly important. And when you'll you get the concessions from like that. No, the first I'm thing I'm going to look CEO, for. Though, what, what are we, I mean, do you, what is your plan to deal with the? You know, with the workers. I mean, there is a workforce that's been committed and dedicated. Absolutely. Uh, and to that, you. what do you do with and, that? And that is why our severance packages are among the best in our industry. It's why. So they're good uh, for a month, six Well, weeks. no, no, actually not. Most severance packages are good for several months, six to nine months. Obviously, uh, unemployment helps. If there is job training that comes in to help these people get retrained, we will relocate let me, people. Let me, let me, let me, let me jump in. Let me we will jump relocate in for people if they're willing let to Let me relocate. jump in for a minute. Jim Fallows, famous Jim Fallows, writes for the Striver City Review. <laughs> and the Striver City Review is a great publication, both on, you know, on the newsstands, fewer now, but also online. And the Striver City Review polled Striver City residents. You are all Striver City residents, so we're going to poll you now. So please pick up your handheld devices. You've been following this story, and you've written a lot about this, right? This is happening all over America. Too much, yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Jobs go yeah. overseas. It is a fact, folks, a fact that more jobs, three million jobs, have gone overseas in the past several years. Here's the question for you. The Striver City has some tough decisions to make. If you have to reduce spending to make these tax breaks available to this plant, would you take them out of education, out of roads and infrastructure, out of fire and law enforcement? Would you do it just across the board? Or would you do none of the above? And just, I guess, let the plant, let econ economics take it wherever it goes. What's the story here, Jim? The story is to help the people in the city and the state and the country understand the larger process they are part of because we all recognize that there's, there's an interaction of things happening on different scales. There are crises like what's happening in Europe right now and you have to deal with that some way to stabilize the crisis. Then there are long-term problems and Europe different ones from here. They have a governing structure like we had during the Articles of Confederation era. So that they're, they have big problems. They have social rigidity about economic change, which is what we're discussing in American too. So I would try to make uh, people in our city understand what was the story of how we came here, what are the options we have realistically to help the city grow and to help the children find their best opportunities so what's here the, elsewhere. So what is the story you're writing? What are you focused on? I'm writing stories short term. What is the decision that the, uh, the chairman of, of, of Earthworm is making? What are the, the political figures doing? But I'm also helping people in the city understand where are we in the flow of history and choices and how do the decisions we make now affect us next week and five years? Let's see how the people of Striver City voted in your, in your public opinion survey. Wow. Nobody wants cuts out of education, Mayor. A lot of people say across the board and you got a quarter of your population saying none of the above. How do you make a decision with that, or do you? Does that help you make a decision? Well, it's a tough decision, and here's a little bit of the history, too, because when Earthworm came to us 12 years ago, we gave the land for the construction of the factory. You gave them the um, land? We gave them the land. We waived impact fees so that they didn't have to pay them at the time. Uh, we've done everything to integrate them into the community and have helped them in every way. So the problem comes at this point where they say now it's not a viable business interest and they want to move to another city. Where does it end for us? Where, do you, where does it end? What are you going to do? Well, where does it end? And that's you, my question to the CEO to, what because no, what about no, the no. past? What uh, are you going to do? Well, I'd like to talk to Mrs. Earthworm because yeah. I, I, I think there might be a little borrowing underneath here because really we, we have given a great deal over the years and you've been a great part of the community. So now um, the bottom line doesn't work in our community and off to another one. And then we're just pit at one American city against another American city. And how does that really help the economy of the state? Well, uh, of course. You, you, go ahead, Senator. <clears throat> I'm the business consultant. <laughs> that's what unemployed senators do right? yeah. I'm the business consultant that's uh, working this problem and I say to Mrs. Earthworm uh, I've seen this movie before and the last time it was called General Motors 
and everything was done to keep General Motors afloat, to keep the jobs, and nothing was done to deal with the reality that General Motors was not selling enough cars. And ultimately, the federal government stepped in, and General Motors went through bankruptcy, and all of their obligations were, were dissolved, and a very substantial number of their employees lost their jobs. And then the President of the United States was delightful to be able, delighted to be able to say, I saved General Motors. I can tell you this factory is not economically viable no matter what the mayor does or what the Congress does. And an attempt to keep it viable by public money and public effort is only going to mean greater challenges and difficulties down the road. All right, I, we're, we're gonna, we're gonna. We're, <laughs> we're gonna, we're gonna leave, you come, we'll come back to Washington, I mean to Striver City, but we're gonna leave Striver City for a minute and come back to Washington. Senator Bennett, Congressman Ridgell, Senator Thompson, and two other Republican House colleagues, two other colleague, uh, colleagues from the House Caucus, Republican House Caucus, you are, you spend a lot of time together. You're pretty comfortable with one another. And in fact, you have a great a cappella group, the Capital Canaries. <laughs> Senator, want to hum a few bars for us? I sing bass. <laughs> <laughs> but today you've gotten together for your rehearsal. And after you sing for your a cappella, there's another song you come to. And this song is something that you're also watching closely in Striver City, because the Senate has passed a budget right here in Washington City. The Senate passed a budget. There's a problem, though. The Senate budget is very heavy on protecting spending, because it's Democrat-controlled and programs. The House budget, meanwhile, has a much stronger emphasis on cutting spending. Now, Unless the two of you guys, the House and the Senate, get together and figure this out, there's this sort of Damocles thing called sequester. No budget, automatic spending cuts right across the board. Mm -hmm. Colleague comes to you and says, Senator, I think this sort of Damocles is the only thing we've got if we're really going to get spending under control here, and this is the biggest problem we face. Are you with me? Can we let that happen? Say yes or no. Yes or no? <laughs> I never have to say answer yes or no to, uh, to anything. Can we let that happen? Well, yes, we can. Uh, I, I, I can't let that just stand, uh, Senator. Um, even if one holds a view that defense spending should come down, this is not the way to do it. It's a sudden, abrupt, even a violent reduction of spending. Uh, uh, Congresswoman Edwards and I have worked together. There are some common facts that are known uh, that are CBO-driven facts. Spending has to come down a bit. Revenues have to come up a bit, both through growth and through tax reform. Um, this is the path forward, but sequestration should be avoided because it hurts national defense, particularly readiness. Senator Bennett, yes or no? No. Why? Sequestration is the dumbest way to allocate federal resources that I can think of. There are some areas that, <coughs> there are some areas where I'm a Republican, but I can say it. We need to increase spending. And it may well be that some of them are in, in <coughs> Survivor City or whatever. <laughs> Not according to you, man. You're just like, cut it off at the knees. <laughs> there, are, there are other areas where we need to cut spending more than the sequestration number. And that's what the Congress is for. And the Congress should not forfeit its responsibilities to a single number automatically set across that ignores all of so the So you would give up your leverage, because that's the leverage you've got to get spending cut. I am less interested in my leverage than I am in solving the problems of the country. Senator Thompson, you would let it happen. Here's a fact. Well, I, Here, I, here's I, a, I, didn't, uh, I, didn't, I didn't suggest that I thought it was a good idea, but obviously it's an option. 
Here's a fact <clears throat> about this sort of Damocles. Mm -hmm. Fact, if sequestration were to happen. 8% mm -hmm. from agriculture, infrastructure, and FEMA. A billion dollars from special education. Three billion dollars from the Pentagon's defense fund. fund. Seven billion dollars from army operations. And Earthworm does some work for the Defense Department. Mm -hmm. So Earthworm could get hurt in this, couldn't it? That's right. Um, the number one function of our federal <clears throat> government is to keep the American people safe. And representing Virginia's second congressional district, highest concentration of men and women in uniform, I can tell you that these cuts are really irresponsible, <clears throat> even if we do believe that over time we should reduce uh, federal spending on defense. It hurts our national security. It hurts uh, job creation. There's a better path forward, and we should reduce it over time, not overnight. No budget, you got the sword. Go ahead. There's no question, uh, but wh what, uh, what he says is true about the defense cuts. The Secretary of Defense said that uh, it would be catastrophic to let se sequester uh, hit, uh, hit the military for uh, half a trillion. But you still think it's an option? Half a trillion dollars. Well, let me put the other side to you for, uh, for just a moment. And I should add, too, that sequester doesn't do anything about the greatest uh, underlying problem with regard to spending, and that has to do with uh, the expansion of the welfare state and entitlement programs and all that. We, we know that that's where the money is. What, what the sequester does is, is take money out of, uh, of non-defense, defense and non-defense right. discretionary spending, and uh, as Bob says, we all like infrastructure, we like, uh, we like schools, we like our state parks and all that. So all those are reasons why it's not a good idea. On the, let me balance again, just for a moment, the other side of the uh, uh, coin. We, uh, we've added $6 trillion to our debt over the last $5 trillion, $6 trillion over the last uh, three or four years. It is a fact that our debt is now $16 trillion. What did I say? You, add, you said we added it. But yes, we the total added now six, is and, and, the, and the total yeah. is about $16.4 uh, trillion. The, the glide path on those entitlements uh, is unsustainable. Uh, we have demonstrated time and time again that recently, anyway, we're not able to come together to address those kinds of issues. So if they come, if, if, uh, if those opposing sequester come to the table and say, we're not willing to give any on the underlying issues uh, that really long term is going to make us a success or a failure as a nation, you can't take sequestration off the table. <clears throat> How are the Capital Canaries doing? I think the Capital Canaries are doing well. And I'm, I would have been one of the optimists in that poll, sadly outnumbered. I'd say, am I still Chief of Staff? You are still, okay. not, not only are you still <laughs> Chief of Staff, but you've convened a meeting of your domestic policy advisor, near attendant, and your very close friend from the Congress, and you are now trying to figure out what do you do, what does the president do if that sword of Damocles falls and these budget cuts happen in a week? Well, I, I would Have say, the meeting. All right. No, what I would say is, look, we, we have got to convene a group of political leaders from both parties. I would say, you know, Mr. President, um, there are some Republicans that You're talking that to your them. You're having a meeting. Guy. All right. Well, but I, but, I, but I have something to say to, to the, 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 the senators here. I would say, you know, Mr. President, in Bill Clinton's days, we balanced the budget. We had economic growth. We passed a lot of significant legislation because we were bipartisan. I said, I'd say, you know, in fact, Mr. President, when I was Secretary of Energy, two of the most far-reaching energy initiatives one was an environmental initiative that saved the MOAP in Utah. It transferred funds to Native Americans, transferred land to Native Americans. It cleaned up huge <laughs> nuclear waste. And there was also a bill in the Department of Energy that to all our Cold War workers that had been contaminated, we resolved the problem. And I say to the president, you know who did that? I said there was a senator from Tennessee, his name was Fred Thompson, who passed that bill, a worker protection bill. And there was a senator from Utah that passed that Moab environmental bill. So what we need to do, Mr. President, is, is, is be bipartisan and it can be done. And we have to bring the business community, we have to, These I think Mr. Arena is right, we need to have job creation. 
have the private sector draft yeah, the jobs program. I don't want program. to interrupt you, but I'm going to. Um, because I think, I, I, I know for certain that I have Republican colleagues who don't believe the sequester is a good idea. And they think it's irresponsible. And we agree with them. And so then the question is, what is it that we can put on the table? Because it's all about a deal. And you know, I'm about as left of center as they get. But I understand that this is about making a deal. And so I think, for example, we have some who say, well, the major drivers are things like Medicare. But, and Frank, I want to put a fact on the table. The fact is that Medicare costs have risen just this last three years, 3.2%. Other health care costs, 4%. And so actually, we've done a lot over the last three years to begin to send those drivers down. What's doing that? It's focusing on things like quality and not quantity. And we need to do more of that to bring those costs down. But we also have to balance it with spending. We know that some of our colleagues, because they got roads and bridges in their district, want to spend on roads I, I got to tell you, this is a great meeting, but you're all giving speeches. Yeah, I got to say. I mean, so you let got me the, just you've say, got a decision to make. The president say, has to do something. Let me say, uh, this is, you know, I'll act like it's an actual White House staff meeting and say, you know, I love the talk of the 90s, and I was in the Clinton White House, too, but these are not the 90s. These are different times. The Congress is much more polarized, Bill. You know that as well as I do. The fact is that, you know, we can have long discussions. We actually have to negotiate. We have to get a meeting together and negotiate about the sequester. Now, we have a position on these issues, which is that we need a balanced approach. They have a position, which is we should only have spending cuts going forward. We've said we need revenue. So the question is, are we willing to go into a meeting and say we're willing to put some savings on the table? We could have some reductions in Medicare that doesn't affect beneficiaries, et cetera and actually get revenue on the table? And do you think they'll negotiate on something like that? Because the issue is we can have, you know, we've been trying on bipartisanship. We all think we should be bipartisan. It would be great if they were, but there are forces at work that are pulling people to get, pulling apart, and we need to actually Since address I'm issues. Since I'm being attacked, can I respond? <laughs> well, it's your job, man. Look, look I, I'm, I'm from the state. I'm a governor, all right? And, and I see all this Washington stuff. They can't get along. There's. There's no bipartisanship. There's, uh, you know, we can't make deals. I have to, as a governor, work with my legislature to balance a budget. It is constitutional. Why can't the federal government do the same? And I'm not giving a speech. What I'm saying is I have seen bipartisan agreements. I, I don't know if these senators were part of that uh, under, under first President George Bush. There's a bipartisan budget agreement. It involved more revenues. It probably cost President Bush the first the election. But I believe that rather than have sequestering fiscal cliff, that men and women can sit around a room and negotiate and get things done, and that's what's not happening here. But that's right, why we so, have sequester, because people can't get things done. That's why you've got the sequester. Let's come back to Striver City for a minute. Farai, you're from Striver City. <laughs> You're the CEO of this company that runs Mrs. These, Earthworm. Mrs. Earthworm. <laughs> it's a family doesn't sound as good as it's Mr. President. <laughs> <laughs> they you make, it that you way. make more. Uh, <laughs> you've been listening to this conversation going on, Mayor, in Washington. Is it helping you? No. What's the connection? As a business person, I think of two things when I hear this conversation. The first is that the most obvious and necessary reform that we have to make for job creation, for competitiveness, and yes, for a balanced approach, is lower the tax rates and close the loopholes. Lower every rate, close every loophole so that there's no negotiation over it. It would produce revenue, it would help small businesses because the tax code is so complicated they can't get through it. And as a CEO of a relatively large company, I worry about little businesses because they are my source of supplies, of innovation, of employees. They create most of the jobs in the communities in which we operate. So lower the rates, close the loopholes, simplify the code. The other thing I think about is running a business Imagine that, that the federal government were a business for a moment and every single department had had its budget increased for almost 50 years. Every single department has had its budget increased every year for almost 50 years. And oh, by the way, 
No one asks how you spent the money. In fact, we make a habit of spending the money as fast as we can in August so that we use it all up before the fiscal year. Right, quickly. A business yeah. would go out of business that way. It well, means there's so much inefficiency in this. You know, I'm, I'm an assistant principal in Striver City, and you know, I- You were a reporter in Striver I, City. I was just repurposed. Oh. <laughs> It's all that job retreat. Wow. Yeah, exactly. Yes, exactly. <laughs> congratulations. Well, it, not congratulations, because if you close your plan, I'll probably lose my job. Families are going to move out of town. The entire school system will shrink. And, you know, if you look at the trends in public employment, um, they're really grim. I could earn a lot more money in the private sector if I was as cutthroat as you, but no, I want to educate children. So, you know, it's, you've got to realize you're hurting people here. Okay, so hold it, nothing, hold it, it, hold it. Nothing would please me more, nothing would please me more, truly, than being able to keep both of these plants open, both of which are in American cities, as you described the situation. So clearly, Nothing would clearly, please me more. And indeed, I believe a CEO's job is to balance the interests of shareholders, employees, communities, well, I was, Mayor, I was Mayor, reading in Mayor, Jim's, Mayor, Jim's Mayor, things, are, things are not going very well in Striver City. No, no, they're <laughs> not. And, and I would ask the senators to listen to mayors uh, because the mayors are absolutely the closest to the public. They're in the neighborhoods every single day. And, and they have a balanced budget and they have to make decisions every day about how to provide the needed services. Um, but, you know, we started with the austerity in Spain and people rioting in Europe and so forth. Well, those austerity measures push those folks to over across over the break, I, I, right? Twenty four percent. I'm glad you, I'm glad you raised that Spain. because we're going to go back to we're going to go back to Europe. For so a don't Washington make the same mistake with your across the board cuts. Don't make the kinds of cuts that hurt people. But at, can, at, can I just on, be the, the NEC director level. for you one minute? You can be the for, yeah. for ten seconds. For ten seconds, I just. I have to say, as the, as the economic advisor now to the president, and hearing these arguments from business about lowering tax rates, these are the kinds of things that, loopholes. in closing loopholes, these are the kinds of things that I think, in a sense, tend to ignore the issues, which is really when we say closing loopholes, deductions, what that means is you're going to hit middle income families. Either you're going to hit higher income families or middle income families. Hold the thought. And that's, these you're are, you're, you're, you're attending to hold the thought because, for business. because in, that's what I was talking in, about. In, in, well, lower the rates, in, close the loop. In Striver the City, in Striver City, you've been watching the news closely. You're watching it now. What you're about to see is really going to take your breath away. <clears throat> A marathon emergency summit is underway among European finance ministers amid emergency efforts to stabilize the EU. But anti-austerity protests appear to be spreading across Western Europe. In Spain, Greece and Italy, there are reports of street violence and some looting. Leaders are calling for concerted action to restore European economic confidence. At stake, say analysts, is the future of the euro currency itself. In other news, a breaking story from the United States. In the Midwestern city of Mountain Way, a major bridge has collapsed. There was no apparent warning when the aging steel span gave way during the morning commute. At least 10 vehicles and their passengers plunged 200 feet into the surging Humboldt River. Rescue teams have been dispatched to the scene. Mayor, this is terrible because Mountain Way is not far from no, you, and your phones are ringing before this is even over, and what you've been told grabs you by the gut because five of those cars that went over were from a wedding party, and the bride was from your city, Striver City. Right. Jim Fallows, terribly, ironically, you wrote this story six months ago. Pothole Nation, you called it. <laughs> what Actually is the, true. What is the story? The <laughs> story is, of course, as news people were covering this in all the different layers, there's all the tragedy in the short term of what happened to these people, what about the wedding and the families and all the bridge and San Luis Rey type of, of narrative. But then the larger story is what we learned for this city, for the state, for the country. We recognize in telling these stories that unfortunately, the American public is usually prodded into large uh, changes by, by tragedies or crises of one kind or another that, that we, uh, we have a hard time dealing with slow boiling problems, but we, have, we can respond when there's a crisis. And so we, this becomes part of the crusade of our publication, which is now going international and with one our of the, audience. One of the facts that you observed in your story, Jim Fallon, one of the facts that you observed is that in the United States of America today, 
more than 11,000 bridges are in need of structural repair. The American Society of Civil Engineers estimates it would cost over a trillion dollars between now and 2020 to bring bridges, roads, the electrical grid, our critical infrastructure up to where it belongs to be to make this a world-class competitive nation. Was that in your story? That was in, in my story, and part of what um, our publication is doing is making its campaign for the next, next few years saying the infra we've had this dramatic illustration of what goes wrong when we neglect our infrastructure. The infrastructure on the East Coast is from the 1880s. In the Midwest, it's from the 1910s. West Coast, it's the 1950s. It's time to rebuild this, and then we can talk about all the things that would come from that for the city and the country. M Mayor, you get on the phone with Representative Ridge. I'll have the conversation. What does this mean for your community? Well, historically, we've received quite a bit of money from the federal government. Call uh, Representative, you know that, and thank yes. you for some of the um, stimulus money that we received um, a few years ago like that helped us a great deal. Uh, well, no, I can just talk. We can just <laughs> this is the way we talk. So um, I really appreciate that last, the stimulus money that helped. But, but just in our Striver City, we have a backlog of nearly a billion dollars. And that doesn't even include Mountain Way uh, and what? the surrounding areas. For roads, for bridges, for wastewater treatment plants. Our public housing was built in the 1940s and the 1950s. It has to be systematically replaced. We really rely on federal money. And I'm very concerned that through this budget cutting process that we're just not going to receive the kinds of support that we've received in the past. Madam Mayor, you may have followed what I've been doing here on this. The fact is this current tax code that we've been under for 12 years yields 16.9 percent and we haven't run our country mm -hmm. on that since 1959. 16.9 percent of, of GDP. GDP. That's the fact and we haven't run our country on that since 1959 and I wasn't born then. Uh, Medicare and Medicaid were six years out. Uh, and I've told my Republican colleagues that revenue has to come up both through growth and also through tax reform. I've rejected the Americans for Tax Reform pledge because it's not right for our conference or our country. And I've also told my Democratic colleagues that we've got to reduce spending. I need some help on spending, but there is common ground with respect to infrastructure. This is common ground. We've got to invest in infrastructure, and I'm going to work with my Democratic and Republican colleagues to advance legislation that does that. That's <clears throat> what you showed there is the best advertisement, the crashing bridge, for entitlement reform that you could possibly show. Okay, that's a very interesting point, because here's what happens <clears throat> in Mountain Way at the memorial service. It's tragic, and there's a lot of grief. M Mountain Way is absolutely grief-stricken, but many of you attend this. And you see a deficit hawk across the room huddled with somebody who has been arguing for serious infrastructure reform. Serious infrastructure reform. And as they're talking about, this is, we're done with this. We have got to do something for the long haul. We've got to do something big here. Have the conversation. Senator Bennett, Carly Fiorino, Senator Thompson, Representative Edwards. Have the conversation. What is the big deal that could come out of this to fix America? Well, as I said, when I railed against sequestration, there are areas where we need to have spending go up, and this is clearly one of them. But as Senator Thompson has pointed out, and as your austerity street demonstrations in Europe demonstrate, Entitlements are squeezing everything else out. So how do you do the deal? And you've got to sit down and say, you know, I know a senator from Utah who wrote a memo to the president of the United States after he got elected and said, this is a Nixon goes to China moment for you. Which senator from Utah would this have been? <laughs> the junior senator. <laughs> <laughs> Which president would this have been? The newly elected one. I see. <laughs> and said, this is a Nixon goes to China moment for you. Because if you can be the first Democratic president in history to say we have to do something about entitlements, you can build enough political capital that you can then do whatever you want in health care or environment or energy or anything else. So now, there's momentum building for something big, here, something this, to solve the problem. We've got I to want get to hear over you talking to one another about what can't that be would touched. be. The business community, I believe, let me just say, would applaud this. In fact, if we knew that there was a real bipartisan push 
for infrastructure spending, it might help us keep two factories open. However, really? The what absolutely because it would be yes. it would be work. It would be work. We need tractors, we need things. But I would say two things. So that it is not like the former stimulus, where some of the dollars helped, but frankly, everyone would admit most of the dollars were wasted. Two things have to be different this time. One, it has to be a public-private partnership from the outset, where business is engaged. Earthworm, we need you, we need your work. And second, there has to be accountability, meaning what projects are going to get built? When are they going to get built? All right, How much are they going to cost? I want to, I want to hear you talk to one another, Democrats I mean, and really Republicans. We really have to operate the off deal. of the same set of facts because I don't think that the stimulus money was wasted. I just don't think we did enough of it on infrastructure. But I think there's and, right, and, we're, I, and we're, I think what I hear from Senator Bennett is that's something we actually could do. We, have, we, we absolutely could agree on it. We could do it through an it. infrastructure financing bank. There are a lot of different ways, and we know that it creates jobs. I'm worried about your um, plant in Mountain Way because I'm concerned that now goods are not going to be able to get across a bridge, which is going to compel what, investing. Near, 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 atten near, attendant, near attendant picks up the phone and calls her Republican friend on the Hill, have the conversation about what this big deal mm -hmm. to rebuild America's infrastructure might actually look like. How would you go about it? How would you right. pay for it? Be specific. So, uh, yeah, I would like to applaud the congressman for his balanced view and his approach, uh, and that he's recognized the need for both for a balanced plan where you can have revenue as well as savings, and that's how you can get to infrastructure. Um, I do think that we have a big challenge, which is that the, there are a lot of folks in your party who want to address large-scale entitlement savings. And I think that there's, there's really two planes people are operating off of. Congresswoman Edwards raised this before, and I know that you two work so well together, which is that we really have, there's a lot of focus on entitlement savings, but we actually have a health care challenge, which is Medicare, just so we all understand, is cheaper per beneficiary than private insurance. So the thing that's actually growing costs in our entitlement area is the fact that we have medical inflation. National health care costs are driving our costs. Now, unfortunately, Republicans and Democrats who had agreed on cost control measures couldn't come together in the Affordable Care Act and agree in the past. But I would actually hope that Republicans, and I hope that the congressman could organize Republicans in some way to address lowering health care costs that will drive savings in Medicare that won't hit beneficiaries, but will address it. Is and that I your think proposal to fix the bridges? And I think that's a way in which you can have significant savings in the federal budget so that you can actually get money for infrastructure. And I would say, what's, as a domestic policy advisor, right. we have lowest interest rates ever. We're going to make these investments in the future. It's smartest to make these infrastructure investments now when we need the jobs. I appreciate the president having this over the other day. The one question I didn't get to ask the president was this, is that, Mr. President, can you show us specifically how you'd address entitlement spending? Because we do have the Republican plan out there. You may not like it, but please don't vilify it. Don't question the motives of what we're trying to do, but instead provide a definitive alternative that can be compared side by side with the House Republican budget. I'm glad we're able to have this conversation privately rather than at the microphones. If you could help us here, but if you could help us here mm -hmm. to work through this and show that we're going to close this gap where we're borrowing 40 cents on the dollar, I will find the money in the remaining funds to get $200 billion over, uh, well, a two to three year period for infrastructure. Mm -hmm. This is yeah. common ground. I'm I, sure I, of it. I completely agree with that. And I, but I would say, you know, the reason why. You know, I appreciate that we don't want people to go to the microphones, and I, I'm, I'm always for that. But I think one of the issues that we have to deal with is that there's a real passion about these sets of issues because that people are economically hurting, and the response here, you know, unfortunately not from you, but other members of your party's party is to say, we really have to go after entitlements, but we can't have so that revenue as part so of it. So here's what starts to emerge from these conversations. The outlines of a big deal a major infrastructure package in return for major entitlement reform, maybe even considering putting up the, some have suggested it anyway in these conversations, 
putting up the age of eligibility for Medicare, maybe even including increasing the gasoline tax so that you have some extra money, because what is it, Jim Fallows, about every penny of a federal gasoline tax adds about a billion bucks? Sure, and, and that, that is the definition of a no-brainer in terms of constructive policy, that, that through the market, the, gas tax, the price of gas goes up and down by you know, large margins during the year. If you could capture some of that for infrastructure, it would be great. And the fact is that the last time the federal gasoline tax went up was 1993, 20 years ago. So infrastructure for entitlement reform, maybe a gas tax, maybe some, oh, you're who's in? Scott, can who's I go in? back to entitlement sure. reform? Who's, can I go who's to in? Who, are you in? I might be. What, what, I want to <laughs> clarify something. Are, are you in? <laughs> All right. No. No. Are you in? I'm in. You're in. Are you in? I'll consider it. I can't. I, I'd have, well. Um, <laughs> yes. I mean, we've got to get something done here. If, I, if it closes the deficit, I'm in. Are you in? Depends on your definition of entitlement reform. Small part of the big picture. I Absolutely, I'm in in the overall, <coughs> overall words, but then you get into what those words really mean, and uh, I begin to say, wait a minute, that's not reform. There's no. nothing in the, your plan that asks, asks everyone to pay their fair share. There's nothing see, in your plan no, that asks the wealthy to be part of the solution. See, what that's you're common. doing is, what, 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 you're, you're, what you have here is a, uh, a disagreement as to the basic problem. We're still hearing talk about tax on the wealthy. We just got some tax on the wealthy. It'll pay for about a week of the running of the federal government. That's um, if we confiscated everybody's income over, that made over $250,000, uh, it'd pay for one year of the deficit. I think that was, the, the, wasn't that 400 yeah, 450,000? Yeah, well, I know, but I'm, being, I'm, 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 just, I'm just saying, if we brought it down to where the president wanted to bring it down to. Um, the, uh, the, the Medicare uh, situation, the Social Security situation, Medicaid, it's all, I mean, uh, the, uh, the uh, Congressional Budget Office and, and everybody who's taken a look at it basically says that it's unsustainable. And the trajectory, I mean, there's no way around it. But, but what, what it was hit on just a minute ago, when someone said with concern, you say, well, you can't do that without taxing the middle class. Exactly. If we can't agree on the nature of the problem, whether it's high income people paying for all of this, and there's really no Medicare uh, bad trajectory here, it's just other costs and so forth, then what's going to happen is, uh, is that there's going to be a massive middle class tax increase. A gasoline tax is, is one of those options. A VAT is one of those options. Value added uh, tax, a, a, a carbon, consumption tax. A, a carbon, like in Europe. A carbon tax is one of those favorite options. These? Would you be proposing? Every cent, no, no. But but <laughs> how, uh, Howard uh, Howard Dean, um, you know, who's always candid, you know, said after the election, said everybody needs to pay more. Let's taxes. see what the public thinks. <clears throat> Let's see what you think about this. I mean, uh, we just heard from Jim Fallows and sort of gasoline tax is a no-brainer. Hasn't gone up in 20 years. Wonder how the public feels here and <clears throat> online. So I'm going to put this question up for you to ask. What do you think of a gasoline tax and how high of a phased gas tax? Remember, this could happen over time. Would you support no increase in gas? Number one, two, 25 cents a gallon, 50 cents a gallon, 75 cents a gallon, a dollar a gallon. If you got a trillion dollar problem. This is for infrastructure? This is for infrastructure. This money mostly would go to re directly to repair America's critical infrastructure. While they're voting, Senator Bennett. You don't have my number down there. What's your number? 15 cents. Fifteen cents. What's the math? <laughs> well, you get to choose. I mean, that's, that's may, I, may I go back to Europe Please. just for a moment? Yes. Because I agree. It's really important um, that we deal with facts, and it's really important that we deal with common facts. So let me tell you about Europe as a business person. Um, Europe, there are certain countries in Europe, many of which are now in crisis, that are absolutely the last place you would ever put a new job. And the reason they are the last place you would put a new job is because the rules around labor are so stringent and so expensive that you, just you can't, can't afford, afford to take a risk. But how else is Europe characterized? So very rigid labor laws that were designed to protect people. 
I, I'm designed, I believe, with the best motives in mind. Second, an extremely high tax regime everywhere. Third, a very high gasoline tax. Fourth, huge entitlements. Those are the four things that characterize Europe today. So it's not growing. Unemployment among the youth is 25% or higher. The streets are on fire because people now in a crisis are trying to cut spending. So why in the US would we decide, raise taxes, add a gasoline tax, not deal with entitlements, and oh, by the way, make our labor issues more rigid than they currently so are. Why would we go down that path? Just, the numbers just don't bear out. I mean, the top one percent. Yes. I think you struck a nerve. I, mean, yeah. I, mean, I, re I really mean that because I'm trying to understand. I mean, the top one percent of income earners in this country have seen significant, yes. significant I, I over the last two decades. I totally agree. And increase in income, and everybody else. Their, their income is squeezed and it's going down. I agree. So Which how it, we can argue that we don't need to balance that but, out at the top? But, but I don't but understand let's, that. But let, let's just let's take but, that, okay? Let, and it's important to why have so many people gotten so wealthy in the last, let's call it five to ten years? Investment income. Why has investment income gone up? Because the stock market today is one of the few investments left because the Fed is printing money. Yes, you absolutely can tax dividends more. You could. You can, you can tax capital gains more. Absolutely. You'll get less investment, but maybe that's a good trade. The, the, the mayor's about to launch here. So. I've got to say something because you spoke about the basic tenets of European society. Well, the basic one of American society has been the free market and capitalism. Then why is your company always asking the government for something? You know, when the, when the I don't believe my company <laughs> asked your government for anything other than we presented a dilemma. And it's a difficult dilemma. And I don't be, appreciate being called cutthroat. Because people who run companies care deeply about their employees, about their customers, about the communities in which they live and work. And we make agonizing decisions every day as well. But when you have only one place that you can put a plant, you can't afford to put two plants. You can only put them in one place. The cities come to us. Some of those cities are in Mountain Way, and they say, we want your plant so bad, we're willing to do and something you for you. take tax money for some, it. Some cities happen to be in Ireland, or Spain, or Brazil. And then, as a business person, I have a choice. If I have only one factory to build, and two or three or four people are telling me to build it in their city, what am I going to do? Well, you, I'm going to take the best deal I can because right. that's what I'm asked to do Jim by Fowl. shareholders yeah. as well as customers. Based on my stand and then for the Daily Striver reporting from Europe, I can tell you Europe is a big place. And you look at Germany right, right. now, yes. high taxes, high welfare, tight um, environmental regulations, all sorts of tight labor laws. Supply. We look at them with envy. Yeah. For their, their manufacturing growth. exports, for all that their their corporate performance. So they're that's one, and, and that's one. <laughs> Number two is Britain, which yeah. is austeri <laughs> austerity its way into <clears throat> another another recession. So right. following the deficit hawk <laughs> prediction, so okay. Europe is a big place. As, as a great. business consultant yeah. who has clients in Germany, <clears throat> I'll tell you why Germany is doing so much better than many of the others, and it's the euro. Germany is an exporting country, and they export to their neighbors. They don't export and the world. Outside. They and the world. Europe China, like crazy. prevents their neighbors from right. revaluing their currency. Sure, but we were the following Germans the logic are that high taxes like made Europe a failure. Jim, where's right. the context for your numbers? I yeah. Surely you're not advocating for us to continue on this 40 cents no. borrowing no, 40 I'm, cents I'm, on the dollar. I am resisting the idea yeah. Europe equals failure. Europe right. does not okay. equal no, failure. I, Parts of Europe equal failure. Let me I, did I, I say I'm that? Interested. Yes. I'm yes, interested. No, I didn't. I said they are in a crisis because of decades of certain policies. And they're and crisis because they're, they're put together in an unsustainable federation. For right. can't last. Yes, putting, putting back on my Washington hat as the uh, Uber blogger, one of our most successful series on our blog has been This Is Where Your Money Went, which is where people in Europe and the United States stand up with signs saying, 
what kind of government money they get, whether it's health care, whether it's welfare. And you know, one of the best ones, the one that went viral, was the author of the Harry Potter books proudly standing with the dole in front of her because she was supported, she and her family were supported by government benefits well before she became a billionaire. So shouldn't we give everyone a chance? And since there is this hysteresis, which is the long-term unemployment, twice as long as any recession in the past, we're gonna have more people who can either fall through the cracks or come back and be productive members. So our blog has really been getting people to stand up, take pictures of themselves. Pictures are much more viral than just text. And if you look at those pictures, what you see is America. So how do you deal with people who would fall through the cracks without some kind of benefit? You know, one of the I, things I, I, that, I, that I'm, I'm curious that you would level that challenge at me, because I think what that implies is you believe that business people or maybe Republicans. I was speaking broadly to the group, but if you care, want to take it on, go don't for it. Don't care. <laughs> and, and if you assume that business people don't care or Republicans don't care, there is no possibility of a Well, I'm a business let, person. Let, I, run, I run this Uber blog, let, blog let, and I, I have a business. The issue is what's going to work. The let issue is in, what's going to work, not who let, cares let, more. Let, let, let me bring in the public. Let's bring back the public and see how people felt about that gasoline tax. All right, the no-brainer that you talked about. Hmm, a quarter in this room who probably don't own cars say go at a dollar a gallon. Take that straight. Live in an urban environment. 33, 33%, a third say 25 cents. 15% say zero. Um, near a tenant, you're the national economic advisor. And you've got people saying, we got to do this. This is a good way to do it. Um, Senator, you've got constituents coming to you saying, I'm I may lose my job at this plant. I drive 30 miles each way as it is. I barely get by. Are you crazy? Guys, what do you say? A gasoline tax is not the only way to have decent bridges and roads uh, in the country. I think an infrastructure deal can be sold to this person uh, as a part of a bigger package. Uh, it has to be something that uh, involves uh, a reasonable length of time to, uh, for a balanced budget goal. I think it could involve uh, a tax reform. Uh, the money. To, if you keep talking about revenue, the money to be raised now, for all practical purposes, the real money that would do something about $16 trillion is in the middle class. So if you want to take them out of it, I think you could do tax reform where you could, uh, uh, you could do a lot of things and simplify it and, and, uh, and reform it without raising rates uh, and without ra on anybody. And uh, then you can have some kind of a, a, a moderate uh, engagement with regard to uh, entitlements. One proposal has been, you know, don't, don't do anything with regard to, to people over the age of, uh, of 55. Means testing, where the rich would pay a little bit more. But the idea that we can continue the way that we're going without touching the benefits of anybody even those younger than 55 uh, just doesn't hold water. So it cannot happen. So here's what's been happening. <clears throat> These conversations about the big deal have been contentious. They have stumbled on every political landmine out there. You have debated who's got the money, who should pay the taxes, whether the wealthy have gotten off scot-free, whether you're really going to get serious about cutting the growth in health care costs. But you've been having the conversations. They've been confidential. But for right today, she's good. She's this blogger, she's good. And she gets word that these conversations are happening. That this remarkable big deal is being kicked around and they might put up taxes and make a big, big cut out of some of these entitlements. You get that leak. Would you write that story? If I could source it, I would write you it. Can, you can you got pretty okay, good. Okay, well then I source it, I write it. But because you, I'm she, because she, I'm a, a, a you know a partisan blogger, let's put it this way. Um, I your, also I also start a petition. What's your headline? The polite one for company, or <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's a family night. Deep doo doo. 
<laughs> Scott Ridgell, you've been, you know Farai pretty well. You're actually one of, not one of her sources on this, but you have a pretty decent professional, I'd be happy to. professional relationship. <laughs> you hear that she's got this story. She hasn't written it yet, but you hear she's got it. You know that these conversations, as difficult as they have been, have been going on because they've been confidential. Caller, what do you have to say? I'd say our country's in a crisis, and this is the moment to act. The American people are ready for the truth, they're ready for solutions, and they're ready for leadership. I deeply believe this. I think the evidence does not support the <coughs> Mrs. Uh, Earthworm's position. It's appealing on the surface, but revenues have to rise. <coughs> this, is con this can be proven empirically. It's the conservative view, am I, as I see it, and, and expenses have to come down. Revenue and, will rise and, if you and, close and the people, and, and people are ready for this. They understand it. The American people are smart. If they'll slow down and stop watching some Gee. of the, you know, the, the, the game you. shows and everything else and really look at the substance <laughs> of what's going on here. Do you ask her not we're to in, write her story? Do, do you ask her not to write her story? No, I, I think it's time to put the facts on the table. Here's we the news. We can't stay on this trajectory. Here's the news. Europe's economic future remains in stalemate. Several European banks have warned of liquidity crises. EU finance officials plead for calm and will be meeting with the U.S. Treasury Secretary, who has been dispatched to Europe. Meanwhile, in the United States, stocks opened higher on reports of secret bipartisan negotiations to seek a long-term solution to the American budget crisis. The package would reportedly include a massive program to rebuild and repair the country's aging infrastructure. Talks in Washington are said to be at a critical point. The story is out, Mr. Chief of Staff, Governor. What does the President say now? Well. What the president should say when he sends uh, Guy, uh, the Secretary of the Treasury mm -hmm. to Europe is, okay, uh, there's been enough posturing, and obviously we can't tell our allies what to do. But the problem in Europe has been that all we have as solutions is austerity measures, spending cuts. What is needed in Europe is a combination of spending cuts and a stimulus program. And the problem has been uh, Germany has taken the lead. I'm not blaming Germany, but that has been the posture of Chancellor Merkel that they want to see the Germans that, that have probably the strongest economy. They have the strongest economy. They want to see significant spending cuts. They want to see them in Spain. They want to see them in Greece. And so this is what I tell Secretary Geithner. Okay, the time has come since our economies are connected for there to be uh, uh, a positive movement in the European crisis, but then I think these budget negotiations, which are not based on uh, simply, th that are based on human beings, Republicans and Democrats getting together, I believe is very doable and possible. Folks, the story. And, and the story one last is, thing, yeah. Frank, that we've ignored at this meeting. There was an election <laughs> that just happened. And the message of the election, I believe, is Guys, women, you guys got to get together, or there's going to be a third party. That's my. Thing. That's one of the reasons you're, you've been having these conversations. But this is out now. It's on the cable channels. It's on the blogs. It's on radio. It's in print. It's online. Everybody, what happens now? I call Frank Sesno and say I want to get on television with some facts. <laughs> <laughs> he happily takes your phone call. Okay. Here are a few that have come out of this conversation. 16.9% or whatever of GDP. Right. That is not because tax rates went down. That's because the economy went down. Tax rates, tax rates income tax, tax, there's, there's no income, respect, there's, there's no revenue. Yeah, with all due respect, tax rates yeah. went down too. No. Yeah. They did. In the Bush I mean, years, the Bush years the tax before, the, before the collapse, the income was well over 18% of GDP before the collapse and of 2008. And it was 19.8 no, in the Clinton years. It's Record. only been over 18% twice, 2006 and 2007, two years where the economy was clearly overheated. 
The, the evidence, I think, right. is very this clear. Sounds like, this sounds like the two of you on a cable show. No, no, I mean, no, no, it's, no. it's okay. I, I want to know. As Republicans, we haven't forget. voted to take spending down to that level. My yeah. question, yeah. My question is, to you is what happens when this. You're going to get the revenue up when you get the economy growing. My question when to you is, what, Senator, what happened to all of you? What happens you when this back. moves I got into, track on that. <laughs> into the public realm? Uh, we, our, our basic entitlement problem is driven not by the government, but by demographics. We are seeing a massive wealth transfer from workers to retirees, and the retirees are growing as a percentage of the population, while the workers are shrinking as a percentage of the population, and that is unsustainable. And that's the problem in Europe, and you can't change the demographics as our birth rate falls and our death Rate, our, our life expectancy increases. That's a strong argument Here's for comprehensive immigration reform, yeah. Senator. Yes. I'm, I'm with you on immigration reform. <laughs> Here are the numbers. As am I, as I bet is everybody in this If I'd known they were going to do this, I'd have the exact numbers. So these are within a few billion. In 2012, Social Security paid out $770 billion. Medicare and Medicaid paid out $720 billion. We were at war in Afghanistan, and the Defense Department paid out 629. That was higher, I think, 700, but. That's what the demographic numbers are doing to us, and we have to recognize that. Jim Fellows. When you want it, one last shot. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> you talk about the rich. Okay, I will confess here personal numbers. I am still working. I am paying $20,000 a year in Social Security tax. I am drawing $41,000 a year in Social Security benefits. The minute I stop working, the $40,000 keeps coming in, only it goes up every year. Why does Warren Buffett, why would Oprah Winfrey, have to draw the same Social Security benefit that was promised them in the 1930s, why can't we say, go ahead and work and pay in the program, but if you've got so many assets, we will shave off the level of your payments on the other side. Well. <laughs> You're part of that and then, and then the wealthy would be paying more. Oh, no, I mean, I mean what I'd like to do is just lift the cap yeah, entirely absolutely. on Absolutely. Why don't you Jim, just lift the cap? Yeah, yeah, Jim, yeah Jim, I agree. Jim, I, my sense is that now that this is public and everybody's going on all these talk shows, this conversation's all over the place. We need the president. Yeah. <laughs> we need, no, I'm serious about That's that, Frank. Right. We need the president because right. it has to give people like me cover to even have the conversation. Yeah. If I have this conversation and it's out there, then any, what happens? What happens? Here's what happens. My friends in organized labor, my friends in the environmental movement, my friends who run, you know, who, who work on, um, you know, sort of poverty and sustainable, you know, programs, those people come at me. I need the president in this conversation so that he can legitimize right. it and so that we can actually come to an agreement. Tell, tell the chief of staff there, tell the national uh, uh, economic director there what you need from the president and see if you get it. Here's what I need from the president. I need him. I need him to say to to lay out what he believes a balanced approach is, because then it gives me some. It gives me a way to say I'm with the president. I think my yeah. colleague Scott Riggle needs the president needs to do the same thing, and give us all a place to go. And it's going to require the president standing out there with a conversation with the American people to help us come to the right I decision. agree. When this plan goes out, the president has to say what his principles are and where, where he stands on the plan. And he has to be the person to say, this is what you know, I think we should do. I mean, I think that's absolutely so right. Yes, because it's the, the only way. Yes. Now, there is, there, you know, there, there are some people, I will say, who I talk to on the other side who say, when the president takes a position, it hardens the opposition. But I think he's the leader, and he still has to take that position regardless. Uh, I'm Gov on. Governor, Mr. Chief of Staff. Mm -hmm. Well, I would advise the president that he has to lay out these principles. I would do it at the State of the Union. I would do it early. As I said, the first year is key out of the second term. It's a legacy issue. And this is the time when voters uh, 
remember what happened in the election. This is the time to do immigration reform, which I think is so would part you, of the economy. Would you put him out? Would you have yeah. him take that position and I would. give the well, congresswoman the because cover that she says she needs? It's not just the congresswoman. It's, it's, it's Democrats. It's moderate Democrats. It's hopefully, you know, one of my hopes is the emergence uh, once again, and, and I, I don't want to call these two guys moderates, but they're good <laughs> moderates, the emergence of a moderate Republican Party that needs to come back. I mean, if you look at the major environmental uh, highway legislation under Eisenhower, environmental legislation, it was always bipartisan. And it was moderate Republicans and Democrats that got it done. Governor, I, I came I, out on, on, on something like this, as I understand the plan, and said, I support this effort. He would have Republican support coming out of the woodwork. He it would be. He would have business it, it support. Would be, it would be uh, Nixon uh, going to China. These problems are are so politically difficult. They would have been solved a long time ago if they weren't. Mm -hmm. They're so politically difficult. Neither party can really afford to take the lead on them because they're going to be demagogued to death by the other party. It's well, going. It's going to take. It's going to take presidential leadership and then bipartisan uh, uh, congressional leadership to get it done. And to answer your question, every group in America about what's going to happen when this news comes out, every group in America, from the people who don't like, oh, we're only balancing the budget over 40 years, you've got to balance the budget in four months. Uh, AARP, every group in America, thousands of them, will descend on Washington. So I'm it's only the president that can deal with it. And the president is going to deal with it. And I've just been given a note that the president is going to take his chief of staff, who is a master negotiator, just came back from Korea, North Korea. <laughs> and your mission, governor, should you decide to accept, and actually you don't have a choice, is the president is dispatching you right now to Capitol Hill to go to try to negotiate this. I know you have to leave us, but you're leaving us to go to Capitol Hill. I want to thank you for being thank here you. this evening. Thank and we will continue the conversation. And, and uh, Governor, if you step off to the left here, the, your, your, your charter flight, because it's a long way from here to Capitol Hill. Is oh. Mayor, um, all this is going on. It's now public. You have a great tradition in Striver City, and you're going to try to take a step toward doing just what uh, the senators here and others have talked about. You're going to convene a town hall meeting in Striver City. And Neera Tandon and the congresswoman, you're going to have bipartisan input. The senators are going to show up, and you're going to have a, a great gathering. And some people are going to show up with Medicare signs saying, don't touch my Medicare. And other people are going to show up and say, don't raise my taxes, because I can barely get by as it is. What are your opening remarks? Well, uh, Striver City has a great history of getting along. Everyone's passionate. Everyone has different views. But in the end, we do what's best for Striver City. And uh, so I've invited the town historian to come to the town hall meeting, because the town historian is going to give a little historical look at the fact that our country has always been passionate and has always disagreed, and that politics has always been a mess. And we just happen to think that it's messier now than it's ever been, but that's just a lack of historical perspective. The country, from its very beginnings, the Constitutional Convention, um, you can go through at any point in our history and say, how in the world did we reach consensus and move forward? What we're debating today is really nothing new. It's just part of America. And it really is it's the best system in the, in the world, while messy, it tends to work out because people ultimately do come to agreement. So at our town hall meeting, you know what? We're going to leave as friends. And ultimately, this is going to get resolved. And that is the history Con of our country. Congresswoman, you stand up there to make your remarks. And a citizen stands and says, I understand you've been considering this gasoline tax. And I'm going to tell you that if you raise my tax, I will not be able to buy food. I may have to not buy my medicine because I can't afford it. Tell me now you'll back down from this because this is a terrible idea. What do you say? You know, I think it's really hard to hear that. And I think I'm, I, I'm going to say to the citizen that I understand um, what you are experiencing and what you believe will happen. But let me explain to you 
how this is going to be better for the country and that, in fact, um, the jobs that it's going to create, rebuilding that bridge that just collapsed is going to enable you to pay for your medicine, to take care of your family. But unless we make those investments, we're not going to be able to do Senator anything. Senator Bennett, somebody stands and confronts you and says, you, I've, I hear you're been talking to people about putting up the eligibility age for retirement for Medicare. I have worked all my life on the lines. I have physical labor. I'm 63 years old. I ache all over. I, can be, I have terrible back pains. You're going to tell me I can't get this till I'm 67 or 70 years old? I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to be able to have that nice white collar job that you have. We're in Striver City, not in Washington, where there are all these business consultants when they get out of the Senate. We're not very sympathetic to that age uh, group. Are we? <laughs> and I'm going to say to him, <clears throat> raising the age is the kind of simplistic approach that people who used to be on CNN talk about. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Medicare is the best Blue Cross Blue Shield <clears throat> fee for service indemnity plan <clears throat> of the 1960s frozen in time. It's like a bad Woody Allen movie. <laughs> Medicare needs to be completely rewritten around the way we practice medicine today, which bears no resemblance whatsoever to the way it was done in the 1960s. And in the process of doing that, we can bring the cost of health care down, we not only for Medicare, but for private insurance, which always follows Medicare, because that's where most of the money and is. And we have and great the, bipartisan the, agreement. The fact about Medicare is that when it was signed into law in 1965, the typical American lived to about 70. Today, they live to about 78. And health care costs were roughly one third as a function of GDP, as a measure of GDP. So let me give you a few today. additional facts, which is that you, I, I'm so glad we have so much bipartisan agreement. We can lower health care costs. We can take steps to lower health care costs. Issues on Medicare are, it's true, Medicare is a growing part of the federal budget. But it's also true that if we have the same growth of Medicare that we've had over the last three years where it's been very low, that's going to take $500 billion dollars over the second decade, the, over the next several decades, or the next two decades, which is one of, you know, which dwarfs the amount of money that we do in raising the Medicare age. Now, the thing is, people talk about raising Medicare age. I would just like to say, we, I believe in raising the retirement age. That was a good step we took because we believe that you should retire when you're older. But we also believe people are entitled to health care. And we shouldn't make people, so you, when, you, when you raise the Medicare age, you're actually increasing the cost on so business. this is a non-starter for you. Yes. Right, no, but I think, I, I do want to have comedy on savings in the Medicare program. I want to, let's, let's, let's just ask the audience, just, just for the sake of the argument, let's see where, where people come on this Medicare issue. Because there are some who suggest this as one way to go, as a realistic response to the, the changing demographics and living longer. Question up on your screen. How likely would you be to support a big deal that would include raising the eligibility for Medicare? Absolutely, somewhat likely, not very likely, no way. <laughs> While they're voting. They're just talking about Medicare, not Social Security. This is Medicare. This is not Social Security, this is just Medicare. While they're voting, folks, <clears throat> I think it's about time to bring this story to something of a conclusion. We have... <clears throat> No real budget deal in Washington, but some efforts at discussion. We have seen tragically what's happened to our infrastructure in a real crisis right in Mountain Way. We know the pressures on the business because you do have to make payroll at the end of the day. That's your job. We also know the social implications that all of this has. And this notion of a big deal of doing something real not for three months from now, not kicking the can down till March or June, but really fixing it. Doing something big has gained some traction, at least in these confidential conversations. I'm not going to tell you how the story ends. You tell me how the story ends. <laughs> well, one thing I would, I would say, make, say is that our... Go Our ahead. readers, you know, after, after we did that series of This Is Where Your Money Went, we also did another series called This Is What I'm Willing to Give Up. And it was really surprising what people were willing to give up that they had as government benefits. You know, some of them were willing to take 
um, you know, less in terms of medical coverage. Some of them were willing to give up, uh, you know, a certain degree of, um, you know, uh, for example, a certain degree of reliance on the city to take care of things like parks and said, we'll do it on a volunteer basis. And so I think that somewhere in this whole mass of the millions of people who responded to these two different stories is the truth, is that people are willing to give things up as long as they get things in return. How do you think this ends? Had a great town hall meeting, by the way, but it was noisy. And you got, you yeah. got an earful well, from just about I, everybody who showed up. I agree with the mayor. Looking back on American history, we've had lots worse problems than this. I had a woman come up to me in the middle of my campaign and said, I've never been so frightened. This is the worst crisis America's ever been in. I said, would you like to have lived during the Civil War? <laughs> and, well, no, she hadn't thought of that. I said, well, what about the beginning of the Second World War? There was no guarantee we were going to defeat Hitler or that Britain was going to survive. And it's become a cliche because everybody has used it, but it hasn't been said here tonight, so I'll be the one to say it. My favorite quote from Winston Churchill, the Americans can always be depended upon to do the right thing after they have exhausted every other possibility. <laughs> and we are in the process of exhausting the other possibilities. The demographics are irreversible and will ultimately drive the right and the left to the reality that we have to make some kinds of changes. Carly Fiorina, you're, you're our realist. How do you think this ends? In this well, conference? of course, the, the honest answer is I don't know. What I worry about, and I really appreciate the reminder of history, because I think it's really important, and we forget history too often. What I worry about is the trust deficit. If you look at every institution, business, Congress, sports figures, the church, I mean, it doesn't matter where, what it is. No one trusts the institutions that operate in our country. Yeah, Congress anymore. isn't doing so well. Yeah, 15%. Why does that matter? It matters, I think, because for, um, for a society to be vibrant and grow and take risks and innovate, we not only need to like each other, we need to trust each other. And so what I, I would be happy if we didn't necessarily get a big deal this year, but what we got was a conversation where people didn't call each other names, people didn't assume that because we disagree we care less than someone else, that people kind of set all that aside and said, you know what, really, honestly, let's trust people to be sincere actors and work towards a solution. Congressman, how does this end? Each generation of Americans is <laughs> faced with uh, a series of problems or one single problem that seem at the time to be insurmountable. This is ours, our fiscal situation. But if we remember that we are first and foremost and always Americans, and we elevate that and, and we say we set aside uh, the deep sense of partisanship if we're very deliberate about reaching out to others and we go where the facts lead us and I think the facts are clear that spending has to come down and revenues have to come up. Um, if we agree upon those facts um, and we believe in the American people, we'll get through this and we'll meet our obligation to the next generation of Americans. I'm convinced that we'll do the right thing in the end. How does it end? How does this end? I have, well, I know me, how it ends. Let me, let me tell you. Okay, Congressman yeah. Riggle is elected majority leader of the House. <laughs> <laughs> and then, <laughs> I'm probably not doing you any favors, I'm sorry. But, um, but uh, he's elected majority leader of the House, and we have a balanced plan, which has a large deal, which has revenues as part of the deal, it has an infrastructure tax of 20, I'd go with 15 it, cents, yeah. and we have entitlement savings, uh, but the entitlement savings do exactly what Senator Bennett argues, which is to transform our help transform our healthcare system into one that lowers health costs. If he's costs. not elected Speaker of the House, 
Well, then we'll do what we what has happened re in recent history, which is we'll go to each one of these each one of these levers: sequestration, government shutdown, and we'll devise the smallest political deal. The elected leaders will devise the smallest deal they can agree with to get them through it, and we'll go to the next burden. Congresswoman, so I, have, I have a different end because. I think there are so many of us who are so tired of dealing in crisis. I mean, we just are. And so I had to examine a little bit what, I was, what I'd be willing to give up. Uh, and so I'm a skeptic on some of the Medicare that's, that might be tied to benefits. But I mm -hmm. think about things like, well, could we maybe negotiate prescription drug prices so that we could bring those costs down? Maybe it is that we could, instead of looking at eligibility age, um, we might be able to consider some other, th I can't say those words, um, at the high end uh, to try to draw down um, draw Would that down be the T payouts. word? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and then, I th then I thought, well, I'd consider a, you know, a gas tax so long as it didn't, you know, without the impact on the most vulnerable. But then you have to consider things like, well, instead of raising retirement age, Maybe we should look at lifting the income cap so that mm -hmm. we can maintain solvency. And then we get the money that we need to do the spending. And let's not leave out real defense cuts. Let me quickly go to this poll. I'm just curious what people yes. thought about, about Medicare. How likely would you support a big deal that includes raising the eligibility age? Look at that. A wow. pretty strong majority would be absolutely I think or somewhat people, likely to I think the people that. are ahead of us and the, the politicians. Let me give you another scenario, the opposite. In the first place, I think, I think can we handle a crisis? Can Congress handle it? I think they can. I think we've proven that we can. I always notice the more serious things get, the more serious the members get. And I think about... I think about 9-11 for sure. I think about even the impeachment that uh, we all went through. There were some bipartisan moments there as to how to proceed and to TARP. protect the institution. TARP. There was not a single, I was in the room, we wrote the bill, I was the senior Republican when we wrote the bill. There was not a single partisan statement made by either side. The problem. The TARP cost you your job. Yeah. The problem with uh, the problem that we've got here tonight that we're talking about is not yet perceived to be a crisis. That's the problem. We're still debating over the basis of the problem and the reason for the problem and what we have to do. So let me give you as much as as I hope against it and as much as I think that we're will be up to a real crisis when it hits if we have time. The likely scenario. I say it's at least 50-50, is that we will continue on. We will not come together on anything meaningful in terms of doing anything about our debt. Uh, we will continue to be at the mercy of foreign bondholders. We will continue to be at the mercy of uh, the ratings agencies. We'll lose not only S&P, we'll lose uh, the rest of them. Something will happen. Europe may get its act together which will mean that we're no longer the one-eyed man in the land of the blind and people have other places to go to invest their money. Or maybe we'll get our act together better uh, in some other ways and the economy, stock market's doing great now. Economy comes up a little bit. Either scenario will result in higher interest rates, right? Yes, sir. That's, Historically that's low interest rates. <clears throat> they this is, are, this is the structural problem. The government is paying about half uh, the interest that's, that's, that they normally have to pay. If we go up to, to historical norms in terms of interest rates, it will wipe out everything that we're talking about. And then the only thing that is left is raising, um, raising interest rates in order to, uh, to control the inflation that by that time that would be uh, occurring. And the only out then will be devaluation. Now that now if you, we now don't really making me feel if we good. don't come together, that is the likely scenario. I'm, I want to come down into the audience for a minute and bring you into this conversation. But as I do that, and before I do that, Jim Fallows. Um, I actually know how this ends. <laughs> <laughs> so I would you like me wait. to tell you? Yes, <clears> actually, Jim, tell I, us all. I, I, I agree with uh, Senator Thompson on the main contours of this. Is this. If this is like any other challenge in American history. We'll talk about this, and we'll work at all the various proposals, and then something will happen that we're not thinking about now. 
the Sputnik launch in 1957, suddenly all the debates about education and science investment melted away. The Birmingham bombings in 1963 had, had an effect on everything else in 1963. The Cuban Missile Crisis dramatized you know, the need for just the, that was the most dangerous time the country has been through. And the environmental emergencies of the late 1960s, something like that will happen. Uh, we hope not, something like, not like 9-11. And then the previous 20 years of talking about these things will be prelude to fairly quick uh, making a deal. So th that's how this will end. You are fundamentally an optimist about yes, this country. Yes, I am. <laughs> Something and, will happen, and we hope it's not that bad, and, and when it does... And in fact, address. your recent cover story <laughs> is titled... Uh, which one? Is America going to hell? That one or a different no, one? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. A different one. No, American Rebound. So what's the American, American, American Rebound. Rebound. Um, I want to ask you all to vote on one last question. And it's the question we started with. Because we're interested as to whether your opinions changed a little bit as a result of this conversation here tonight. And so the question we put up, pull out your voters, for those of you who are online and watching on C-SPAN, we asked the question we started with. If a national crisis arose, how confident are you that the President and the Congress could agree on this proactive plan of action? Maybe even a big deal. While you're voting, I want to call on one of our special guests here this evening who's in the audience with us, Frank Farenkoff. Frank is the co-chair of the Presidential uh, Commission on Debates. Presidential Thanks for Debates coming Commission. to me, Frank. I want to thank you for the opportunity. Well, I want to not put you on the spot, but I want to ask you, you know, your whole career, you have been in politics or near politics. As the Presidential Debates Commission co-chair, your mission has been to get this kind of conversation, debate, in front of the American people. What's the moral from tonight's story as we apply it well, to I, our current I political structure? Well, I think that bipartisanship does exist in Congress on local state issues. Let me turn you when this way were, so we can yeah. see the camera. So when, the when they were arguing about what they were going to do to help the cities, they all gathered together, Republicans and Democrats, to do what was necessary to help their local state. We saw it with Sandy. You had Republicans and Democrats from New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut joining together. I'm originally from Nevada. For 30 years, and too bad Bill's gone, uh, Republicans and Democrats in Nevada, in the Senate, we don't want nuclear waste buried in Nevada. And it's so anything that touches the local state touches their constituents and touches the people who are going to vote for them. When we get to national issues, however, it's a different situation. Different dynamic. And what we've got with the dynamic today is the number is out of the 233, I think, Republicans in the House, only 16 of them were elected from districts carried by President Obama. Of the 200 Democrats, only eight, I think, something like that, eight or nine, were elected from districts carried by Governor Romney, which means that the greatest danger to these Republicans and Democrats, particularly in the House, and as it turned out to Bob in the Senate, is in the primaries. And what happens is if you're a member of Congress, your great concern is to protect yourself in those primaries from people coming at you. In the Democratic Party, they're coming at you from the left. In the Republican Party, they're coming at you from the right and pushing you. I think Congresswoman, Congresswoman Edwards touched on it. There's only one way around this, and it takes leadership. It takes leadership. Leadership to provide cover. That's a terrible word, but it's the truth in politics. To get people the courage to stand up and do what's right. Now, how do you get there? Carly touched on it. The members of Congress of the two political parties, I've been in this town for 30 years, they don't know each other anymore. They don't spend any time with Rachel, each other. I've heard you talk about they, we they have don't. people to dinner uh, for that reason. The, the reason that LBJ, if you read the Carroll book, was able to get the Civil Rights Acts passed was what? Well, it was the Republicans in the Senate that passed it. The way that, L, that the President and O'Neill could get something done on Social Security. Tip beat the hell out of the President all the years I was chairman of the party all week long, but they went over and drank Irish whiskey on Thursday nights and told jokes up in the family court. What do you recommend to change the dynamic? What can Two be done? Two things. I think that we ought to pass a law paying for only one trip home a month by members of Congress. The most dangerous place in this town is on a Thursday night at Ronald Reagan International Airport where you're going to be trampled by members of Congress running for the planes. So there's got to be some way that we bring them back together. The president's got to lead, and I think 
the leaders in both houses of both parties have to lead. They've got to get some backbone to stand up and solve these problems. That's the only way I think it's going to help. Thank you, Frank. We have the, the president of the student body of GW here. Where did he go? He left it. He didn't come. Are you GW? Yes. Well, guess what? You're next. <laughs> this story, in many ways, is about you. Because this is the debt that you will inherit. This is the Social Security that you will or won't get. Why are you here tonight, and what is your take from this? I've always been interested in how policymakers can come together with differing ideologies and sit down and just have an honest talk. Because when the news cameras are off, you don't have to appeal to the most, I guess, high energy members of your party. And I guess when the news cameras are off, really, is when you get to sit down and get to business and get work done. And that's what I'd like to say. What do you, Justin, what do you study? Political science. <laughs> what do you want to do? Be a politician. <laughs> How do you feel after tonight? It's going to be a very long journey. <laughs> <laughs> wish you luck. I want to, last comment uh, tonight from, uh, uh, from the Bipartisan Policy Center and from uh, Jason Grumet, who um, started us off here. Your thoughts? Um, let's go over here, because that's the camera that's on, with a little red light. <laughs> well, thanks, <laughs> Tell us Frank. what you thought and what you concluded from it. Well, I guess, you know, a couple of um, reflections. I mean, I think the, the first is it's really great to have this kind of fusion cabinet discussion. You know, it's not just Democrat and Republican, but also to have multiple layers of government, um, to have, you know, reporters and uh, political commentators. That doesn't happen a whole lot. And so I think that really does broaden uh, the insight. But I guess two things occurred to me. One is I think the mayor made a, a great point about just how messy this is. And I think the idea of the public getting comfortable with that messiness is really going to be another part of the political cover that's going to be required in order for Congress to have the opportunity to make the uncomfortable agreements that will be necessary. The second piece that I thought was really um, interesting and nicely brought out was that it wasn't really just a partisan question. We had our moments and flashpoints on those issues that you remarked on, but the, the local, state, and federal government divisions are critically important to this debate, and I don't think get um, thought about as much. I also thought, thought it was uh, terrific how much we focused on the business community. I think Carly did an obviously fantastic job representing, and so sort of tough, you know, you were in a tough position shutting down those factories. But the larger question about the kind of role of business in social policy, the role of business in governing, particularly as Congress becomes less and less functional, oftentimes it's business that has the long-term kind of adult-in-the-room perspective. And I think trying to understand how that fits into the larger democratic challenge is important for all of us. Jason, thanks very much. Let's see what the public, or what public watching and in the room thought asked a second time, and whether the before and the after uh, made us more optimistic <laughs> or less optimistic. Okay. And Interestingly, more? people more. are more optimistic yeah, after true. hearing this conversation. That surprised you? I see you nodding your head. Thank you. <laughs> Carla, are you surprised by that? No, actually I'm not. Um, I think what, you know, I think it's human nature that um, if you're not talking with somebody face to face, it's easier to caricature them, vilify them, say, God, they don't get it. It's a lot harder when, you know, well, okay, maybe she still thinks I'm a cutthroat, but maybe, you know, maybe we've come up. It, um, the point is, I think, um, solving problems takes people working together. That's it. I, you know, that's kind of basic, but that's what it takes. And um, so I think what people maybe saw was folks with very different backgrounds and points of view talking together and trying to solve a problem that's really tough. I would like to thank uh, all of you for what I think has been a very honest and a very interesting, very interesting and informative conversation. For us to get a sense of what the dynamic is, you need cover, you need leadership. What you believe passionately in and how you engage and how that conversation might sound in private and what the impact might be in public. For the observation, because I think if I'm not mistaken, you were a Grover Norquist tax, no tax. Three, four, three and a half, four years ago, that's correct. The, and you, uh, the, and you the, ripped the data, that up. Well, the, and, and I, I, I'm really a little bit troubled by this idea of cover, uh, because 
I can't as an American wait for five people, the President and leadership in the House and the Senate, if we're not getting the job done, we, this is what Americans do. You go over, around, through the proper channels, respectfully and with civility, but I was told not to do this because politically it would hurt me. You were told not to do what? Not to distance myself from the ATR pledge. I made the decision in January before that November election, and I said to my advisors, I said, no, I can't hold on to this and not act on this. And they said, well, can you at least wait until the primary because you'll get primary? I said, no, the American people in the second district need to have a choice. And see, I'm convinced that if the American people have the right information, they'll make good decisions. And I'm, I'm back, okay? I'm back for a second term. And, and they, I'm just, there's, this gives me the greatest hope because I told my Republican friends that, rep that revenue has to rise and I explained it to them on a number line. It's, 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 it's pretty clear, I think. And I tell my Democratic friends that expenses have to come down. American people get this, and they're ready for leadership, and I, I know we can do this. I'm convinced of it. I cannot think of a better note to end this conversation <laughs> on than that. Mm -hmm. I would like to ask you, if you haven't already, check us out at facethefactsusa.org. We put out a fact a day. We try to connect the fact to some, to, to some context, because context matters, and sometimes even some consequence, but we don't take a position on that fact because as you've seen here, you can have a healthy debate based on the facts. But if you don't start with the facts, the debate by itself is misinformed. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much, panelists, for, tra for traveling here and being so generous with your time. Thanks to C-SPAN and to Huffington Post and to all of you in the room. And thanks again to the George Washington University for making all of this possible. Thank you, panelists. Good night and good luck.